Hey you guys, this is Raphael from ShilohRelics.com. Good morning. I'm up bright and early, decided to come in and knock a few of these out so we'd have some for the next week or so. I hope that you guys are doing well. I hope things are getting better in your area. Uh, ours, there's a lot of people sick, but fortunately most of them are making a little progress getting better. And if you are sick, I hope you know that our thoughts are with you and we wish you only the best. Today we're going to talk about a sword that is very important in U.S. history. It's the U.S. Model 1840 Enlisted Man's Cavalry Saber. You often hear these referred to as a heavy cavalry. They get this name because the Model 1840 was one of the first uh, ones that were ordered that were very large and massive and bulky. The Model 1860, the next style, was more streamlined, lighter weight, and so they referred to the new ones as the light cavalry and these as the heavy cavalry. These are the Model 1840, and this one was made in America, but the first contract was actually made through Schnitzler and Kirschbaum in Solingen, Germany. The U.S. government ordered those in 1841, and they were outsourcing even back then. This model they made in America, this one's made by the Ames Company, and you hear me talk about Ames all the time because they were, uh, argue, they were the biggest sword manufacturer in the U.S., and they also uh, produced this one, which is the first, uh, which is the American-made version of that one that they bought earlier from S&K Schnitzler. The, these swords were made in America between 1844 and 1858. They, that first contract was for 2000 and they had subsequent, subsequent, subsequent contracts for these swords uh, until 1858 and they didn't always get them delivered that year that the order came in because if you look at the statistics they're staggered and one year they'll deliver 510 one year they'll deliver and so there's uh that's why you see a lot of variation in date on these the early ones um you don't see as often in the late ones uh they made a total of 23,700 of these between the contracts from 1844 to 1858 <clears throat> They uh, are interesting because they sold them to the government for $7 a piece. <laughs> that was a lot of money back then. So you got to remember, a lot of money, a lot of sword. It is a massive sword. The handguard is made of brass, as you see here. The uh, guards are nice and thick. It has a three-branch guard, which is classic for cavalry. That's what you usually see. Artillery will have one. Uh, cavalry will have three. They have a large piece, we talked about that before, it's called the pommel cap, and that's what holds the blade uh, with the guard, the grip, and it holds it all together. The uh, grip of these swords, like this, have a wooden core, and they are uh, turned to make a groove on that wood. They wrap the leather, and then the wire that they put on top of that kind of seats down in that groove as it goes around. Most of the time, because these swords, uh, especially the early ones, saw service during the Mexican War, they saw service uh, with the troops out west, uh, which would have been Texas, up in uh, Utah uh, when they were out on the Mormon campaigns. So they saw a lot of service, not including the service that they saw in the Civil War, because they were still delivering a lot of these all through the war. Uh, they were put them in, putting them into service. There's a notation in, uh, my buddy John Tillman did a book on cavalry sabers of the Civil War. Great book if you can find it. I think it's out of print, but if you find one, you ought to get it because it's got a ton of cool information. And one of the things that he noted in it was there's a letter from uh, General Stoneman dated February uh, 27th, 1865. So the war is basically over. And they have all of this new stuff, but he says he would like to get the 11th Michigan Cavalry, uh, they've got 250 of the light cavalry sabers, the new and improved model. He writes a letter and says, can we please get these guys the Model 1840? 
So you know it was a tough model. You know it could take a, 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 the abuse of uh, action during war. So he wanted those guys to get the old model, not the new model. Sometimes newer is and better. And what makes a Model 1860 different from an 1840? Mainly it's the width of the blade. Uh, they thin that blade down. They uh, lighten up that guard, not as much brass. The handle is very distinctive. You can tell a 60 from a, a 40 a mile away because the 40 looks like this. It's a straight grip. The 60, they did a good improvement on it. This is one thing that they got right. They add a bulge in the middle of it, which fits your hand better. So it was easier to hold on to, especially if somebody was coming at you with another sword and or a pistol and or a carbine, you had a little better chance of holding that sword uh, when you were going into action. The blade on these, the ordnance, uh, calls for a 36 inch blade in the regulations. The Ames is almost there. It's like uh, 35 and seven eighths and 35 and all, it's almost 36. So basically 36 inch blade. Uh, it has two fullers. The fullers of course are the grooves in the blade that were added to make the blade more durable as well as to lighten the blade. The, uh, they have a, because the blade is wider, because it's heavier, the scabbard is heavier, which makes the whole sword more massive. This one has the original scabbard. The scabbard is complete. It's got both rings, which are these. It's got the throat, the drag. It's a nice sword, and you don't see as many of these. They, uh, because they just got worn out and, and lost to the ages. This one has the Ames mark as well as the Calicville, Massachusetts production location like this. It's got the 1849 production date. So it's right in the middle of production, 44 to 58. So it's right in the middle of those productions. Uh, it has, if you notice, it has the US and then down below the US, it has WD. You remember what we said those stand for? That is not War Department. See WD on something from uh, England, it's a war department, but on this, it stands for the inspector. Remember how we've talked about the inspectors? The inspector on this one was William Dickinson, and he was the arsenal sub-inspector. He approved this sword for military use. You'll usually see on an AIM sword, you'll see that mark on the blade, and there'll also be one or two up on the top of the pommel cap. He only inspected from 1848 uh, to 1850, so it's right in where it should be. Sometimes you'll see swords that are restamped, and sometimes they'll screw them up because if they had an 1861 uh, cavalry with his marking on it, it's wrong because he wasn't he wasn't doing it then. So something to look for on that. You can go on to ShilohRelics.com. You can see this one. You can see these several others. I uh, buy every dated Ames cavalry sword that I can get that has a little bit of future left in it because I like them. Because they are one of the blue chip stocks of the Civil War business. You can always count on them uh, because people like them, because they were desirable then, they're desirable now. Even General Stoneman in 1865 said, I need 250 of them. And I feel the same way. I need 250 of them. I hope that you guys are doing well. Uh, I've been trying to think about what to talk about at the end of the segment because man I tell you a few of those here lately have been a roller coaster for me uh, but I just and I know I sound down a lot of times I just want to take one second and I want to say thank you I've had so many people be kind to me and I think we all have and that's what I want you to do I want you to think about somebody that has been kind to you and most of the time it's folks that don't realize what that kindness has meant. I hope that you guys take just one little second and when you see them say thank you for being nice to me. Thank you because it's made a difference because uh, I've, we went to a gathering the other night. Oh no, a gathering with people and we lived through it. But I looked at a lot of those faces around there and they were faces that uh, You've heard me say before how some people come to the front and some people disappear. I was surrounded by those people that came to the front. And what a cool feeling when you, you look. 
I'd rather have two true friends than 10,000 wannabes and 10,000 fakers. And I'm lucky. I've got some of the best in the world. I've got a lady that treats me better than I could have ever dreamt. Uh, and I, I'm thankful. And I wanted to take just a minute and, and I hope that you sometime today stop everything you're doing and think about those acts of kindness that people have given to you because they're easy to overlook. There's so much crap in the world that uh, you can focus on just the bad. But think about the kindnesses. Think, and, and, and it's it's stupid, but I've noticed when people open the door for me, when I'm walking in somewhere, I'm like, they took one second out of their day and opened the door. It was such a little gesture. It doesn't mean nothing. And most of the time, it doesn't happen. But when it does, it's like, that person thought about somebody else instead of themselves. And I hope that I opened that door for you today. I hope that you open that door for the next one. And I hope you look around and see those people that are there for you. Because they will get you through some horrible times if you have horrible times. And I hope you never do. But remember to tell them thank you because they're there for you. I hope that I'm always there for you guys. I hope you know that I wish you only the best. Hope you remember I love you and I'll catch you next time.